Welcome to season three of Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. At the end of today's episode with Dr. Foreman, he shares a few stanzas from the poem, America the Beautiful. It's very moving, and I asked if they could send me a recording of the John Adams Academy Choir, Virtus is the name of the choir, singing their rendition of America the Beautiful. So if you stay to the end, you will be blessed to hear a beautiful rendition of America the Beautiful. Enjoy the show. For this podcast episode, I am delighted to introduce you to the founder of a wonderful charter uh, public school in California called John Adams Academy. So I'd like to welcome Dean Foreman to the show today to tell us more about this wonderful school that I've heard so many good things about. And I even had a chance to participate in a, a little seminar workshop at the Society for Classical Learning Conference this summer. And it was a delight to meet many of their wonderful teachers and to hear their good thoughts about uh, a piece we were reading together and discussing. So Dean, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Adrian, and share what I think is happening all over America. And that's a revolution in education, especially classical education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one of the things I'd like to keep in mind is um, that my heart is especially geared towards parents and teachers um, and actually board members, because a lot of I've noticed in my years with working with schools that a lot of times the board members are very disconnected from the school, and I don't get that impression from the interaction I've had with John Adams Academy. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's something that was very um, impress impressionable on me uh, when I worked at the University of Dallas with Dr. Matthew Post. He strongly recommended uh, that I speak to you guys and that you have a wonderful school. I know you've done some uh, collaborating with Dr. Post, and uh, you know anything that Dr. Post recommends to me my ears perk up. <laughs> yeah, we actually uh, had him out here to be our graduation speaker this last spring, and he did an absolutely fantastic job. And he's a person that loves classical education and has been a pioneer in so many ways at the University of Dallas. And so we're, we we're pleased to have him here. Yeah, so start us off with uh, telling us the history of, of this school and why you founded it. And I'm sure that that will dovetail into the problems we're seeing in the, the uh, schools in our country today. Good. Well, uh, the story uh, begins probably about a little over 20 years ago when my daughter came home with a high school newspaper that said, let's talk about sex. And as I opened up the newspaper, I thought, is this really what schools have become just nothing more than a culture of uh, poor dress codes, poor speech, uh, talking about subjects that should be confined to a health class. But uh, as I talked to parents, it, it was, <laughs> that's what it had become. And so I set out on a journey to get on that school board and try to make a difference. And we did make a difference in that we uh, did put a pause to the release of young females to go outside the school without parental knowledge for birth control and abortions, which I thought was an abominable thing to have a school board as a, an accessory to that sort of a crime without telling their parents. And that changed. But as I got further in there, I could see that to put new wine into old bottles, as the saying goes, or as the biblical injunction goes, uh, just wasn't gonna happen. We needed to have new wine and new bottles. Oh, that is so true. That's true. So how how did you, I'm sure you have an amazing story. How, how did you go about 
creating new wine and new bottles for this vision. <laughs> <laughs> How did you go about that? We have a lot of people who listen and who are on our Facebook page who actually are starting classical schools. And uh, I, I'm sure that they would be quite inspired to hear that you've done it and it's been a success. Well, I love that. Uh, you know, what a beautifully uh, American thing to do start a charter school. I mean, that's how America started, right? They got charters from the crown and they came here. And I thought, this is so American, so uniquely American. And so um, about three years ago, when my wife um, had the misfortune of of having to take care of her parents in their um, declining years, her father, her mother died unexpectedly. Uh, she couldn't uh, stay here with me at home all the time. And so I decided to write a book and it's called John Adams Academy, leading a revolution in education to do exactly that, to help people understand how the, this story can go, how they can liberate their communities with education and learning. And I think it's a noble thing to do. It's not without uh, a lot of difficulty, but, um, uh, I guess to start this story, it started with my wife. When we got married, uh, I thought I was educated because I was really good. I had a business degree. I loved um, scripture. I loved, uh, of course, sports and cars, but I thought that was kind of the extent of, of knowledge and I didn't have a classical education, but she did. And uh, whenever we'd go on vacation, she'd take me to museums and art galleries and and music things and concert halls. She's a, uh, a very accomplished pianist herself. And I was introduced to things that I'd never experienced. And, and it got, it lit a flame in me. Uh, like she says, I've, I've lit the flame of really a, a very passionate person, which I am. And so as I started to read the classics and I came to a seminar by my mentor that was about 1999 or 2000. His name is Dr. Oliver DeMille, and he wrote a book, A Thomas Jefferson Education. And I read mm -hmm. that book, and I and he, of course, encouraged us to, to homeschool our kids. And uh, I thought, well, we aren't qualified to do that. But as I got into it more and more, I could see, well, certainly my wife is very qualified to teach them uh, British literature and uh, art and music and so forth. And I thought, well, you're you're pretty good at business and economics and uh, also history. And uh, so we did uh, start to do that with a charter school that was a, what I would call a, a homeschool charter school where you could do mm -hmm. your own educating and they'd come in and check your work periodically. So th that's kind of how it got started. We homeschooled our last two boys and they loved the classical method of learning, though the Socratic way of teaching. In fact, mm -hmm. unfortunately, sometimes that spoils children so much that when they get to college where they have someone stand up and lecture and be the sage on the stage, they just hate it because they don't wanna you know, participate in that sort of learning. They think it's right. really a, a, a inferior way of learning. And I agree. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, this is kind of had the rumblings of it. And then in 19, or not 19, but it was about 2006, I received a phone call from a good friend of mine that, well, he became a good friend. I didn't know him at the time. Um, his name was uh, Father Lino Otero. And um, I love this priest. He called me on the phone and he, in a very heavy Hispanic accent, he said, hello, Mr. Foreman, this is Father Lino. He says, uh, you don't know me, but I know you. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, how can I help you? He said, well, I have some, some kids over at Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I'd love you to teach them about uh, education and about leadership and how to become leaders. And I said, okay, how would we do that? And he said, well, how about Fridays? And so for the next three or four years on Fridays, for two hours, I went and taught these kids. I thought, what a better way to incubate this idea of maybe someday having a school than to try to do it that way. And uh, I just loved him and loved what he was doing. He was trying to do something different. He too used a, a charter school that was an independent study charter school to allow him to then also teach the kids um, the uh, you know various things in terms of the Catholic faith and um, 
course, charter schools are public schools, so technically you can't have teachers come in and teach faith. But if it's independent, they can then schedule times to teach catechism and other things to their youth. And I thought, what a beautiful way of doing it. I loved him. He's an academic entrepreneur. And that's what I felt mm -hmm. like I wanted to be. And so uh, we fast forward a little bit further, and I, I didn't know what a, what effect all these things would have, but but you'll see the, the little trail of a breadcrumb just kind of built along the way. And along the way, um, we took our boys because we found a beautiful uh, classical piano teacher uh, about two decades ago, and she was from the Philippines. And um, she said to us at the time how much she loved teaching them. And when they went over to, to learn from her, it was not a typical piano lesson. This was an adventure. She taught them about the actual, uh, you know, big names of the piano profession that did all the great works like Mozart and Bach and Beethoven. And so they were learning uh, these about these great artists, but then they were playing their music and then she would feed them. So they'd be there for like two or three hours, you know? And I was like, wow, wow where do we find a teacher like this? So then I, I told the boys, I said, you know, Tara Sita has been such a wonderful teacher. We need to do something nice for her. I said, we ought to take her back to the Philippines because she hasn't been back. Her family was kicked out during the Marcos regime, but because her, uh, her uncle was the Archbishop of the Philippines, he was able to pull a few strings so that they could escape from really imprisonment. Um, and so they came to America and she didn't have any money and she taught piano and made cakes, wedding cakes. Uh, very gifted lady. So we go back to the Philippines and I'm, I'm thinking about this idea of a charter school and I'm thinking, how in the world do you do this, you know? And uh, if you know the Filipino people, you know they are probably the most uh, kind mm -hmm. and hospitable people in yes. the world. I have they, a good friend. Yes. She's just amazing. Yes. Yes. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like they've exported all of their, their beauty and their people. Yes. Their people yeah. are just so beautiful. Giving. Very yeah. giving. Yeah. Very big hearts. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I, oh, my word. So we go over there. I'm thinking we're doing her a favor, taking her back to see her family and so forth. Well, that wasn't the case mm -hmm. at all. These people were going to treat us like royalty, oh, and they yeah. did. And before we went there, she says, you know, my son-in-law, he's a, he's in, def he's in, uh, what'd she say, a security is the word she is, security in the Philippines. I said, oh, that's nice. And she says, he'll meet us at the airport. Well, we were met there by an armed entourage because he was the minister of defense of the Philippines. Wow. So we, <laughs> yeah. We go through the middle of Manila in this armed entourage with the sirens going, whop, 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 whop. Wow. And it's like the Red Sea party. And we're, I told, I looked at my sons and my wife. I said, what is this? This is like being a head of state. I said, yeah. this is unbelievable. So for the next four or five days, we went to see uh, the Hotel Manila, all of the memorabilia that um, General MacArthur's wife gave to them. Uh, we, we went to uh, see them some of the sites in terms of, uh, I, I said to them, they said, well, where do you want to go? I said, well, I would, I've always wanted to go to Corregidor Island to see what happened and see the Bataan Death March where that happened because I love history. And so, you know, they flew us in a helicopter and landed us on Corregidor and shut down the island. And we got to have this private tour oh. of Corregidor while we were there. And so, as you can see, you can't get ahead of the Filipino people. It's like right. you you be you could try to be hospitable and you you may be no. but but they're gonna outdo you no matter what because of the just pure yes. love for you. That's true, and their hearts are really big and true. Like it's they're not faking it. It's a genuine kind kindness that they carry. It, it's it's beautiful. I agree. We went to Morocco and had a similar experience. The people in Morocco are also very lovely. Yeah. It's very humbling. It's very humbling. I cried almost every night. Like the kindness of these people is just, you can't even put words to how, how beautiful it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. I, in fact, as I, as we went to leave, uh, 
we had just a few more days there. And I said, we've got to try to do something for these people. I mean, to, to, to do something that is hospitable for them. So I said to them, I said, do you have a charity or something you, you like? And they said, oh, yes. Uh, Sister Mary James has a charity that's on the outskirts of the dump in Manila where she's made a school. She's built a school for children that have been abandoned. And I thought, oh, my goodness. I said, can we go see that? They said, sure. So we went to this to see Sister Mary James. And she indeed have did have a ministry. And it was a Saturday. It was between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we show up. And uh, as we come in to the school, um, I notice there's this guy. He's, put, he's building, you know, a brick wall to make a bigger school. But all these children, we walk in. They stand to attention and they start to sing Christmas carols in English to us. And of course, if you've been to the Philippines, they probably speak three languages or a combination mm -hmm. of the three, Filipino or Tagalog and Spanish mm -hmm. and English. And mm -hmm. uh, But they started to sing to us. And of course, the tears just start flowing down. I'm thinking, where do they find people like this? So beautiful. And... Uh, as we're leaving that day, Sister Mary James, I said to her, I said, so what is this gentleman doing here? He's all by himself. He's trying to build onto the school uh, some walls. And she says, oh, we need to expand the school because there's been lots of children that, that rummage through the, the refuse to find things to sell on the streets. And I said, oh, my goodness. I said, well, what does it cost to finish a school like this here? And she told me, and it was a fairly modest sum. And I whispered to my wife, I said, write her a check for the full amount. And so she wrote a check and I handed it to Sister James. And she it looks at it. She almost starts crying. She goes, I knew the Lord would provide a way when I started this Aww. ministry to do this. And I said to myself, I looked at my wife. I said, you know, if a little Filipino nun in the Philippines can start a school, why can't we do something like this in California, in America? It's got to be infinitely more difficult here to do than it is where we live. And so the, these are the kinds of things that happened. It was just unbelievable, you know, and, and the, the, it hasn't stopped. I call it providential, as the founders called it, because it is providential that you meet people at certain times in your life when only they can maybe give you that flame or light that flame to take you to the next place you need to be, the next destination. Wow. That, that is a very, very beautiful story. Oh, I'm having a hard time. I'm crying. I mean, just the thought that your, your school, that John Adams Academy was founded on the experience of meeting a beautiful nun in the Philippines is really profound. That's beautiful. Well, um, the school still exists there today. And I still, <laughs> um, you know, send them uh, an annual donation because I just feel that strongly about what they're doing. They're doing really the work of angels, I would call it. When you are working under adverse mm. conditions and situations, and yeah. we do too in what we do, um, but not to the degree they do, at least economically. Uh, and what sure. she's doing, she, the other part of her ministry was she was taking care of small children. You know, she was educating older children, but she was taking smaller children that have been abandoned in Manila off the streets. And I thought, oh, my gosh, who, who would do something like this? And only angels would do so, something like that. Wow. So speak to the, the, the listeners I have who are starting a chart or starting a school a classical school, whether it be a Christian school, a charter school, whatever. What tips would you give to them in starting a school? Well, I'm a I'm a big proponent of Stephen R. Covey and the seven habits of highly mm -hmm. effective people and the way you approach things. And so the first thing that we did was we got together, I got together a board. I found people that I knew shared common things with me, but they had gifts that I didn't have, maybe with facilitating groups or gifts for entrepreneurialism or a gifts for accounting or law. And so as I brought a group together, we then met to, and we had a facilitator and he was on our board and he said, you know, let's, we need to start with a mission statement and we need to start with core values and what would enliven that. Because ultimately I was speaking with uh, 
some of the people that run the school over the years, I said, what is our report card as a school? Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, well, it's the culture. And the culture has to start with a profound and bold mission statement. And our statement was uh, namely this, that John Adams Academy is restoring America's heritage by developing servant leaders who are keepers and defenders of the principles of freedom for which our founding fathers pledged their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor. That's noble. I can get behind that. It says something. It does something. You know what I'm saying? That is a beautiful mission statement. Can you say it again? John Adams Academies is restoring America's heritage by developing servant leaders who are keepers and defenders of the principles of freedom for which our founding fathers pledged their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor. I love that. I love that. I want to talk more about, about that, but I want to let you keep going with, with your okay. tips. So then that that uh, infamous evening we we then talked about what our values would be and we you need to have and those core values are now on in every wall in the school in terms of in the each classroom and then in the library and other key points because what you want to do you can tell if a culture is the right culture because you don't have to have tons of rules or laws or regulations. In fact, I tell people all the time, right. that, you know, culture and decline, you can't make enough laws because we live in a free culture. And the only thing that keeps us free is virtue and religion and <clears throat> having people of, of that sort of caliber that have moral character. Right. And so that's what the core values speak to. They start with appreciation of our national heritage, uh, emphasis on mentors and classics, um, public and private virtue. And then as you get to the 10th core value, it's what I would call the pinnacle of the creation of a scholar is self-governance, personal responsibility, mm -hmm. and accountability. And that's what we want to do is to create. People will say, well, what, what kind of child comes out of there? I tell them it's real simple. Great citizens and great souls. And they mm -hmm. love to lead and they know how to do it. They know how to ask questions and think and make decisions. And they can do that because they've been educated in a, in a classical way where you learn truth. And with truth, you recognize beauty. And with truth and beauty, you then are built or equipped to do the good. And that's what this sort of education does. It makes great souls. That's right. That's right. Now, with I, I, I have read your 10 core values, and I was really impressed with them. And I remember when I read them, I thought, this sounds amazing. Now, how do you do this? How do you do that? How, how do you actually achieve the 10 core values? And I know that my passion is in training teachers and in educating parents on what a classical education is, so that because we have so many parents who are seeking this out right now. They, I mean, the movement is exploding because parents are really wanting an alternative, like what you built for your for your children, and um, but they want to know before they decide to you know dive into the classical world. They want to know what is classical education, right? So my passion is to help parents understand what classical education is, and train teachers. So that's what I do. I'm I'm passionate about pedagogy and how teachers are taught to teach. So I would really love to dig into how you train your teachers. I was impressed with them uh, when I met several of them. I must have met about 20 of them. Uh, and and, and the, the way they communicated was very, very um, intellectual and caring. And, and I appreciated that they clearly had different opinions. They had different uh, understandings of the text we were reading. And yet the dialogue was so respectful, which is exactly what we need our students to see. Our students need this model for them. So obviously your teachers right. have been trained and they know how to do this so that the students can learn how to have a respectful 
you know, disagreement, if you will, right? About because yeah. these mm-hmm. these texts that we're giving these kids to read, classical texts and uh, uh, original source documents to learn history, they're very controversial, and y- it, you're going to come up with all different opinions on it. So, how do you go about training your teachers? Okay, well, this uh, core value will lead into it a little bit, I think, and that is that we start each day with the raising of the colors and they do the Pledge of Allegiance, they recite the core values and each class takes that over um, each day and does that. They sing then a song, a patriotic song. They use a quote or give a quote. It's kind of a devotional time of the day and it's Mm -hmm. for about seven minutes and then they go to their classes. Now the teacher's role in this is to allow the scholars as they're reading and doing the classics. Classics are unique because they they allow us to project ourselves into what's happening at, without having to make the mistakes, you know, that sometimes people do and not compact mm-hmm. it into these stories, or it could even be the plays of Shakespeare are these wonderful principles that are a, you're able to glean out and then apply and so then once again you don't have to teach rules you're you've taught the value and then they can move forward now our teachers one of the big you know challenges that i don't know if you've had but i think most classical schools find is that how does generally speaking and i'm saying generally because there are some places that have good classical education programs like the university of dallas but many places do not. And so how does a generation not educated in the classics educate a new generation in the classics? Exactly, exactly. Yes, that's the challenge I have in training teachers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Embedded in the classical model is that this idea of mentors. You hmm. have mentors that are people that have been down that road, that have embraced the classics. And because hmm. they've been down that road, they can get together with others and what we call juntos. And Benjamin Franklin was a big one on that. So he had been, he said that um, he brought together this junto to have them talk about great ideas or things they were reading, and then they would teach each other. And they would have basically Socratic discussions. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we do with our teachers is every week we want them mm-hmm. reading. In other words, The fact that they don't have a classical education is not the biggest problem. The the biggest problem we have is first to find people that have the heart, that want Mm -hmm. this sort of virtue, this sort of education. And what you find is that people that find it, they'll say, oh my gosh, where have you guys been? Yeah. (laughs) You know, how come I never knew about you? And then they get in there and they're like, wow, I just can't get enough of this. And it's almost like, like with me, my wife turned on that light and then it was like, I can't get enough time to read and learn. And so what Mm -hmm. they're bringing to classroom each day is because they're learning, they're bringing something fresh every day. You know, sometimes whether we're classically educated or not, teachers generally speaking, they'll get into a groove, they'll have lesson plans, they'll have ones that they created you know, a decade ago, and I'm thinking for crying out loud, how does that excite someone? How can you even get excited about it yourself? Because it's old to you. You've taught it hundreds of times over and over again. But as you learn new things, as you're diving into the classics, the beauty of that, what it beckons us to do is to come out of our shells or to, as Plato said, come out of the cave. Cave. And as yeah. we come out of the cave, we look around, we go, oh my gosh, look at everything that's out here. Yeah. And then you want to go back in, you say, hey, come on out here with me. I got to show right. you something really cool. And that's oh, how I it love happens. That. Yes, that's so good. So do your teachers have weekly meetings? Are they assigned things that they read and they do they get together and do like a seminar, a Socratic Correct. seminar? Yeah. Every week. Every week. So yes, when I, when I work with schools, I try to encourage that, but not... Every uh, board member or uh, headmaster is thinks that it's feasible to ask them to do that every week. And uh, well, you know so what? how do you board how do you make that happen? Board members need to be doing it too. Thank you for saying that. 
Yes, I have found that the schools I work with whose board members attend the teacher training that I give, the school is much more successful in implementing everything because the board members yeah. were there. It's it's amazing the difference that it makes to have the board members understand uh, what's really happening. But like, so every week, is it like a one hour meeting after school? Yeah, How do you fit that in? It's mm -hmm. like one hour. We do half days on Friday, so it's typically Friday afternoons. Perfect. And uh, yep, they'll that's meet another in their thing I recommend. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And Anyone new starting a school, this is what I say: pick one day a week. It's a half day, Wednesday, Friday, whatever it is, and do do uh, teacher training. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really important. Yeah. So so, what kind of texts do they read? Do they read full books or do they read essays, short texts? Uh, I would say all of the above, um, mm -hmm. depending on you know what they're and they're typically dividing into grade levels or. Uh, like maybe, and sometimes they'll do maybe K through th second or, you know, third mm -hmm. through fifth or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, the principle behind this, and I think it is, you want them to read things, but you want them to read um, things that are related to what they're teaching a little bit, but then also mm -hmm. just get the big philosophical landscape. In other words, it helps to understand the the outcome that you're seeking in education. It's like the mission statement of the school. You you can't just be so narrow or siloed that you stay in your one area. If you don't venture out and see the music, the art, the mathematics, um, the the literature and see all of it and how it comes together, because it has to, you can't study any subject without bumping into the others. And as they That's start right. to do that, then it comes together into one whole and it's called truth, people. And that's what makes it so beautiful. And it's about you, not them. That's the, uh, my mentor, he had uh, seven principles of learning and the last one was you, not them. In other words, it has to be you. You cannot educate another person. You can inspire another person and that inspiration more than often will be you being so inspired that they want to learn. Right. That's good. That's really good. How many students do you, your school have? We have three schools, really four. We have an online school that uh, got started because of the COVID situation. Mm -hmm. And um, there's about 1,500 in each school, K through 12. So wow. there's about three or four sections per grade. Per grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, each classroom or section would have about uh, 30 in it. But as we get to the higher grades, like to high school, um, I would like to say that we retain all of them. But, you know, one of my biggest discouragements of, of education is to see a few of them that want to go to the, uh, the local high school because they want the high school experience. And I said... Okay, well, what about that do you want? Do you want the uh, debauchery that happens in, in those schools? Or what is it that you want? And I don't mean that negative. I, there's a lot of good teachers mm -hmm. everywhere. But what right. I'm saying is their cultures are bereft of goodness for the most part. They don't have that same culture which inspires learning. And they're arguably at the pinnacle of being able to use the rhetoric that we're trying to get them to use to express themselves because they've gone through the grammar and logic and now it's time to put this all together in a beautiful you know uh, panoply of of uh, being able to express themselves and so that's what i think they're missing and so we want to get them to come to that realization but and the uh, upper grades i guess my point is is sometimes and i i would tell people this one of the beauties of our school is that in the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grades, a lot of those classrooms have 15, 20, maybe 25. So the numbers are less. And it, it is better in terms of the mentoring model because sure. mentors is part of the classics to me. You can't do mm -hmm. the classics without great mentors. Sure, sure. Is it? Uh, do you guys have sports? We do. We have, uh -huh. um, uh, and we play in a league, 
that is uh -huh. a charter school league. And the reason I like the league that we're in is because, as you know, sports in much of education has become the curricular instead of the extracurricular. Sure. And that's my right. other complaint <laughs> against them. I said, well, if you want to go to get the extracurricular, because that's when they're saying, I want the real high school experience, they're saying, I think I've had enough of the curricular. I want the extracurricular as my curricular now. And I'm like, right. well, you that's realize that that thinking. extracurricular is not going to sustain you through through life, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. I had a feeling. That's why I asked if you guys have sports. <laughs> so that's a driving force for some people that they want to be on the best team, you know, in the leagues and yeah. But they will play basketball at our school. They'll do soccer. They'll do volleyball. They'll do golf. Um, mm -hmm. tennis. So we, we do have teams and they compete. But like I said, this isn't going to be the end all where they're sure. trying to be the greatest athlete in the world. Although we have many athletes that get athletic scholarships that come mm -hmm. to us. And in fact, one of the greatest accomplishments, I think, is when you look at the GPA of our athletes, it's in between a 375 and a 385 in most of the situations, which is really nice. exceptional. Sure. What about your high school music program? <clears throat> well, that's, <laughs> that is the beauty, isn't it, uh, mm -hmm. of education? And it's, I would say it's still developing, but in many ways, it's really come into its own. We have, um, uh, a Virtus Choir that I went mm -hmm. to Nashville, Tennessee with this last spring. And here we've got, you know, we've got a school with about 500 scholars that are 7th through 12th grade. And we're competing against schools that have thousands in their mm -hmm. high school alone. And we took first place. It was a, wow. a, an, a, just a phenomenal accomplishment. And um, you know what it starts with, Adrian? And you know this because you're talking about teachers. It starts with a teacher that has great passion and vision. Sure. So when we yeah. went to hire this person for music, our choral program, he showed up at his interview with a five-year plan how nice. he was going to do it. And I thought, where, where do you find someone like this, you know? Not right. only did he come to do his interview, he came to tell us what he would do if he were in that position for the next five years and create something great. And he's done it. Yeah, he's developed it. That's, that's, um, that's and when wonderful. you listen to what they're singing there, the, the variety of what they're singing is amazing. So it will be mm -hmm. classical pieces, but it will also be uh, some gospel pieces, um, uh, some African spirituals, You'll also uh, have pieces that are Americana because one of the unique things about our academy, at least for me, was I love the classics, but I also was raised in a very right. patriotic home. And I thought the yes. beauty of America was it brought together Greece and Rome and said, these are the best pieces of that to make a constitution that will be everlasting, that will go further and last longer. And this is how you do it. And uh, so... America is part of this, this beautiful, you know, what we're trying to put up there for the children to learn is to actually love America. I tell people, what's, they'll say, what's, what do you like about your school? I said, well, we actually teach them to like America. And uh, I love people that. laugh and they'll go, wow. Yeah, we had a podcast episode a few weeks ago with Dr. Richard um um, Dalhide, and he is also very American. And he, in that podcast episode, he talked a lot about how when I was in school, he rattled off all these songs. He even started singing some of them that we had never heard because, you know, he's in his 70s and he grew up in American public schools when they were patriotic and they were good. And uh, it is, I, I love that you're bringing that back. I think it's important. And I, I, I mean, we even sang patriotic songs when I was a kid, but uh, it's, it's, sad to me how much of that is is gone it's it's lost and so i'm so happy that you're doing that it's very important yeah yeah i i couldn't agree more
Yeah. So John uh, Adams, how did how did you pick John Adams to be the name of your school? Was that in your book? Well, that's that's a good entree on that because <clears throat> I love John Adams. When I was, and so here's the other maybe part of the story is that when I started to do listen to my wife, I decided I wanted more education, more than just a master's degree in, in financial planning and estate planning. <clears throat> so I went back to school part-time to get my PhD in constitutional law and philosophy. Oh. And as I was doing it, I was reading about the founding fathers and their writings. And one of them was, Jan was uh, John Adams. And the reason I liked him was an, because he was the heart and soul of what brought America to the forefront. Now, as you know, he was on the committee with Franklin and, and Jefferson to do the declaration. But he said, Jefferson, you're a much better writer than I am. You, you need to do it. Besides the fact that this can't come from someone from the North, it needs to be someone from the South to do this. And so, you know, he was chosen and he did it. But as you know, on July the 2nd, when this was presented, and if you read in McCullough's story and many others who have it chronicled what happened that day. It said that as the declaration came forward, that Adams got up and they said that, or Jefferson in his own words, he said that his way of expression moved us from our seats. And ever after I would refer to him as the Atlas or Colossus of Independence. And I thought that is the man. And not only that, but he had a beautiful family. He was married happily to the same wife. He was loyal and faithful to her. They had, I think it was six children. Um, you know, a few of them went overseas with him. They became great ambassadors. John Quincy at the age of 16 was over in Russia, you know, and I thought, what an education. Now that's a classical education if there ever was one and a great mentor. And so as I looked at Adams and then, you know, he eventually uh, went to the Netherlands, got them to give us and loan us some money. He then went to England and uh, became the ambassador there during the Constitutional Convention. And Jefferson was over here not doing any, any less than Adams was in terms of his ability to rally the European powers to allow us to become what we did. And so I chose him because of his virtue as an individual. And he said this, and this I, I thought to myself, this is not going to be a prophecy that's going to be completely fulfilled. But he said that no great monuments or mausoleums or anything else would be built to him uh, in his, after his time. And uh, I thought to myself, that's not true. I'm going to build a school that's going to make you proud because Aww. you did something for America and bringing freedom to the world that we appreciate so much. Oh, that's a beautiful story. I hope that in your school, you're having your students read Abigail Adams' Witness to a Revolution by Natalie Bober. My daughter read that book, We Homeschooled, and she read that book when she was about 11, maybe fifth, sixth grade, and she loved that book. It was one of her favorite books from all of school. She's 24 now, and she still talks about that book, and it is letters back and forth uh, between Abigail and John. It's a, it's a beautiful book, a a Abigail Adams' Witness to a Revolution, and I would recommend it for your middle school students, uh, for all of them to read. It's, it's a very, very good book. Um, I'm writing yeah, it down. I, Thank you so much. Yeah, and when I, <clears throat> I worked at a, a classical charter organization in Texas, which I'm sure you're familiar with, Responsive Education Solutions. Yes. And and I worked. I was the director of classical methods and wrote curriculum and developed teacher training. And one of the thing, first things that one of the very first curriculum pieces I wrote for them, uh, because I wanted the students to uh, learn what narration or um, copy work. I wanted them to implement copy work. They were transitioning a bunch of schools to become classical. And I thought, well, phase one, one of the easiest things to help them become classical is copy work and picture study and recitation. So those were kind of the main things, but I knew they needed to have really good text. And Benjamin Franklin did copy work as a habit. When he was a child, he started doing copy work. He recognized the power of copy work. So I decided I wanted the fifth grade students to read a section from his autobiography. So the chapter 
where he talks about his boyhood, I thought, well, these kids can relate to him because he was a boy, just the same age as them, yeah. growing up in his uh, brother's print shop and uh, and his story about about that and the abuse he he went you know under his brother, and then uh, how he started doing copy work and that whole section. Well, as I was preparing that whole section for the fifth graders to do a reading over the course of a week and have them read and narrate and do some copy work, um, I realized there were a lot of vocabulary words in there that the teachers were going to freak out about. Because when I lexiled the book, it lexiled at a 10th grade reading level. And this was fifth grade. And I thought, these teachers are going to go, these kids can't do it. It's too hard. It's a 10th grade reading level. So so I immediately kind of went through, defined a lot of words for teachers to go over with the kids before they would do the reading. I'd say, here's some words, just review them quickly and then read it and read it along with them. Let them follow along and narrate. And and they narrated. And narration is really important because it does help them to remember and to keep it. And yeah. uh, so they don't forget the story. Well, so they did that at the beginning of the school year. And then in January, I went back in. I was encouraged from the corporate academic office to go in and interview the teachers and the students to find out, you know, we were piloting it. So how's it going? You know, the different reading selections I've given the students, how's it going? And I went in and I actually met with a group of fifth grade kids. We had a video crew with us. And uh, these little kids... We asked them, um, so which story of all the stories we gave you this year stood out to you the most? And they all raised their hand and they all said, <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. The <laughs> and I was shocked. I said, well, do you remember it? Because they had read it in August and this was January. So it had been several months. They were raising their hands eager to narrate. And they remembered everything from the story. Love all it. of it. They understood it clearly. <clears throat> um the teachers told me that when they did their benchmark check, uh, vocabulary testing at the beginning of the school year, and then they did it again in December, that their vocabulary went way up on the on the benchmarks, right? And I had, after that, a couple of little kids, two little kids, a boy and a girl, and they were foreign children from another country, so obviously had been taught curtsying and bowing. They both came up and the little girl curtsied at me. The little boy bowed at me and said, thank you for giving us hard things to read because we did it. <laughs> so what does, what does that tell you about the nature of a child? Oh, that, that is so good. You know what it reminds me of <laughs> is that when COVID was starting about uh, two and a half or th almost three years ago now, um, here, you know, for two months, we closed the schools in April, mid-March to, you know, the end of the school year in 20. But we opened back up in the fall because I just thought this is this is ludicrous, crazy stuff. But um, I took a couple of sixth graders uh, that were, uh, I knew the, the fathers of one of the boys, and I said, um, why don't you tell those boys that I'd like to treat them to lunch at my office? So they came to my office for lunch. And I said, you know, what do you guys want to do someday? And one of them said, well, I want to go to Harvard. And I said, that's awesome. That's where John Adams went was Harvard. I said, did you know you can go to Harvard now? You don't need to wait. He's, he looked at me and I said, that's right. I said, you know, back in the 1920s, about 100 years ago, the Harvard classics were put together. It's called the five foot shelf of books. And I said, the equivalent of reading those books was the equivalent of a liberal arts degree at Harvard back in those days. I said, you could go now. And uh, he got excited about it. And from that, I then started this challenge. And I said, any of our scholars who complete the classic, the Harvard Classics Challenge and read those books and write a paper about the book they've read, what they learned from it, the principles gleaned from it, they will get a scholarship for $1,500 to the school of their choice. And I said, the big deal is, is that that's going to be minor because when you go away to school, if you've read even a portion of those, and of course in our studies, they read some of those books, not good classical programs, but if they read all of them, the, the ability to go into college, they're like 
eons ahead of all the others. It's amazing. Oh, sure. Definitely, for sure. And they're going to have to read some of them again, but that's okay. They're worth reading again and again and again. <laughs> that's why they're a classic. Exactly. Exactly. And you glean something different from them with each phase of your life. As you get older, you see different things. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, this so is been... here's something that you might want to consider too. Um, you know, I had a really good mentor and he wrote a Thomas Jefferson education, as I mentioned, Oliver DeMille, but he came to school. To class one day he says, All right, he says, When was the last time any of you did anything for your grandchildren? Well, this was, you know, 15, 17 years ago. I didn't have any grandchildren at the time. Now I have 12, but I didn't have any then. And I thought, what kind of question is that? And then he says, and when are you guys gonna finish your dissertations? And and I'd started to give him some and he just rejected them. He said, I'm not gonna accept any dissertation. That, that just sits on a shelf. It's gotta be something that will change the world. If it's not gonna change the world, don't bother, because it just sit on a shelf. Mm. I'm thinking, well, that's a pretty high bar. So as I thought about this, um, and then as I mentioned, I met Father Lino and Sister Mary James and some other things happened. And I thought to myself, well, what about uh, starting a charter school? I'll do a project in lieu of a dissertation. He said, I love that idea. Give me a prospectus on it. And I did. And so the academies be became my uh, dissertation or my project uh, that's a living, breathing uh, dissertation. And so that's, that's uh, awesome. such that's a cool so story. Amazing. At least it was for me. Um, and he accepted and it. That's amazing. I love that. That is a really great story. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That is beautiful. That that's really cool. Well, um, we like to end our podcast episodes with the question. Um, can you tell us a quote or a book that has had a profound impact on your life? Okay, I was thinking about that a little bit. There's been a lot of books. Uh, certainly I mentioned Thomas Jefferson Education, uh, but one that I found at a used bookstore. Um and it's an old book. It's, you know, well over uh, 150 years old. It's called Prophetic Voices Concerning America by Charles Sumner. And uh, what he compiled were men and, and women who had written about America and prophesied about it. And, of course, one of the sections that I loved in here was, of course, John Adams. So listen to this, what Adams wrote. He said, um, I always consider the settlement of America with reverence as the opening of a grand scene and design and providence for the illumination of the ignorant and the emancipation of the slavish part of mankind all over the earth. That's what classical That's education is. Yeah, that's beautiful. I thought, wow, he he saw the vision of what America could do to the world, and even mm -hmm. though you know we look at classical education and and of course it has European roots and so forth, but no one brought it together like the American dream or the American mm -hmm. beauty that came about, and I call it the uh, you know I in my book I talk about the patriotic sequence. You may recall Catherine Lee Bates when she went to uh, the World's Fair in Chicago, and then she got on a train and went to Colorado. And that beautiful hymn, America the Beautiful, which was a poem. And uh, if you listen to that poem, it'll, it'll take you through that sequence when it says, uh, Oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet who stern in passion stress, a thoroughfare of freedom beat across the wilderness. And then, you know, the next stanza, I think, goes something like, oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster city's gleam undimmed by human tears. And as you go through this, and then the, the one stanza talks about, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. And I, I think about this and I think that's the patriotic sequence. You go from being a, a pilgrim to a pioneer 
and then you you build equity so you become a patriot you have something you build equity in something and then you want to protect it and that's what patriotism is about and so that's that's my favorite quote that's beautiful thank you so much dean this was this was a real treat i really appreciate that you took the time to to come on the show today well thank you for inviting me and uh, best of luck in all you're doing uh, because we're all um, lighting the world in our own, you know, stewardships. And I can tell you're doing some great things and helping schools. In fact, I would love to have you help us in some way some sometime. I'd, I'd love to learn more about your work and uh, how we could uh, use your services in some way. So thank you so much. And to your listeners, I hope that they will have the courage and I'll leave you with this. You remember... Um, Winston Churchill and what a beautiful, you know, he took the English language to war, as he says, and he did it so well. But he said that in every person's life, there comes that time when they are figuratively tapped on the shoulder and asked to do something that is uniquely fitted to them. And he says, what a tragedy if that moment arrives and they are unprepared for what could be that finest hour. And the finest hour that we have is where that preparation and that passion come together and say, I need to do something about this. Quit sitting around the table saying someone ought to do something about it. That someone is you and me. That's right. Thank you. That, that was very well said. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Dean. All right. All the best to you. Yeah.
Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, Well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be, in a few words, this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know, best of all, what it is to behave under it, as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven. <laughs>